I am your host, Soli, and here we got Peter from the Rise of Hogs podcast. Yes, hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Stray. Um, I wrote and directed a an audio mini series uh, called uh, Old Habits, The Rise of Hans, which is a sort of action comedy prequel to Die Hard from yes. the point of view of <laughs> Hans Gruber. Um, and, you know, I, I think there was there was a, a podcast called Script Notes, which some of you may be familiar with, hosted by yeah. John August and Craig Mason, very, very successful screenwriters. They did a, a Christmas special on Die Hard ages ago. And I, I started writing this this series and then I listened to this podcast and they said, well, I mean, you know, from Hans Gruber's point of view, the whole thing's Ocean's Eleven. <laughs> and, you know, I'd love to see a movie about how he he got the team together, and I'm like, I'm I'm sort of writing that, um, right? Everyone wants now, to know more. <laughs> yeah, obviously, this is uh, you know this is a satire, and it is uh, f- what what is called fair use because it is satire, and so um, <laughs> that's basically done that way uh, partly because um it, it, it is what it says it is like it is it is a comic take on these characters and secondly you know that way 20th century fox can't come after me and, and sue me um mm-hmm. I, I i mean in some ways it's like that's a good problem to have because they knew i uh, they know i exist but um <laughs> uh yeah so 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 it's 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 a comic take on you know you could, you're gonna meet hans you're gonna find out like he's gonna you're gonna start off with him in berlin uh where he's a member of the radical Volksfrei group if you remember from the die hard uh, newscasts they talk about that and um you know then you're going to find out basically how he got to la and how he and put the team Simon together Gruber was basically more violent we can kind of take and just kind of went his own way like see your brother <laughs> uh, that's right yes i mean i mean the great thing about uh, the sort of Gruber dynasty is that is that since die hard three then you've got this even bigger backstory um you know in terms of when i knew that so the, the Jeremy Irons character was was Alan Rickman's brother. I thought, okay, that's an awkward family dinner. I want to sort of be a fly on the wall for. Yeah. Um, so in, <laughs> in in episode one, you will hear um, you will hear the awkward uh, Gruber family dinner interchange. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah, and the mum and the sister are there as well. So that's you know you've got a whole bunch of characters. You'll you'll meet a whole <laughs> bunch of characters throughout the series you're familiar with. Some of them, quite surprisingly, you might not expect Hans to bump into them before Die Hard. And That's there awesome. are also some some fun new characters in there as well. <laughs> that is very, very cool because, you know, we all got to laugh and we all got to just kind of just remind each other is like, hey, it is what it is. It's very annoying when people just kind of want to just make things awkward. <laughs> Uh, or, do, do you mean in do you mean in life not, or or a, or a uh, fictional or villains family? Just dinner? about movies. Like I'm kind of wishing we had just more, just kind of just fun. Just reminding everyone, hey, we're all here to kafa. Oh yeah, I mean, what I love about Die Hard is that it's not just a fantastic action film, but there's also a huge amount of comedy in it. Um, you know, even I, I mean, you know, and 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 Rickman obviously, I think, makes Hans Gruber one of the the greatest screen villains of all time. Um, you know, because he's a classically trained actor who's used to to playing comedy, playing drama, playing all these things, and he came in and he had such good ideas. You know, and luckily mm-hmm. the script, script, the screenwriters listened to him, even though this was his first movie, which is just nuts to me. Um, it totally is. It's just like, whoa. <laughs> you know, like Rickman really sort of shaped the character. You know, Rickman said they were going to put him in combat gear, and he said, "I'm going to look ridiculous next to these giant men." You know, let's like, not, why not make it me- like Commando, where he's got chainmail. Let's make it more like. This. No, exactly. Let's put me in a suit. You know, and so they listened to that idea, and then he was goofing around doing American accents, and they said, "Well, why don't we have him pretend to be a hostage?" So all these things came came from Rickman. You know, I don't want to take anything away from. Uh, Jeb Stewart, you know, and um, Stephen D'Souza, who wrote the script, but but the um, uh, but but Rickman really shaped a lot of this character, and and so, you know, in in Old Habits, The Rise of Hans, um, you know, there's a lot of tribute to Die Hard, but there's also lots of tribute to to Rickman, <laughs> who was one of my favorite actors. You know, big big actor man crush on on that guy, and I'm very oh, totally. sad that he's <laughs> no longer with us. Also this week. Clarence Gilliard Jr., who played the fantastic Theo, just passed, passed away. away. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, RIP, all respect to him. He was brilliant. So, yeah, the, the, the quarterback I mean, really... is toast. 
Their quarterback is toast. Yeah, he was fantastic. It's the and only one just... who like gets away technically. Um. Yeah, and and there's also the the the, the wimpy young uh, villain that uh, Christoph, like his assistant up on the machine floor. I think he gets <laughs> he gets knocked out. So two of the terrorists get knocked out. And then all the rest of them, you know, get get shot or thrown off a building. So they, everybody else dies in horrible ways, apart from from two of them, uh, which is actually quite quite generous to terrorists in an action movie that two of them actually survive. Of all things, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh man. So that's so so that's my that's my case for why uh, why Hans is certainly out of Die Hard villains the best, and 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 definitely one of my favorite favorite movie villains um and you know uh, so if you like um sort of you know if you like a laugh if you're if you're a total diehard geek and you like sort of um sort of audio drama then i, I do hope you check out um old habits the rise of hans uh, podcast and we've also got a companion podcast where um it's just me and some of the actors chatting about diehard and geeking out like we're doing now <laughs> even better <laughs> Oh man. And uh did you always have uh a pretty cool like uh uh just batch of friends who you could talk movies with? Oh absolutely. I mean I'm very lucky in that I've not got only got a bunch of uh movie geek friends, but I've also got some fantastic uh actor friends. I trained as an actor myself and you know I've done some stuff on TV, some stuff on stage. Uh uh, and um, you know, I have actor friends uh, similar who are also movie geeks. Who, and a lot of them are in this podcast. You know, I've got friends who have been on Broadway, who are, uh, you know, done stuff with the Royal Shakespeare Company. Or, you know, all, all this kind of stuff. And they, and they've all donated their time and talent. You know, or um, accepted, you know, far less payment than they're worth um, to to play uh, characters in this podcast. Uh, and as you know, the great thing about doing an audio drama is if someone has recording capabilities you can sort of zoom in with them like we're doing now and then read the lines together and then they send you the audio files <laughs> and i i create this whole thing on my laptop so you know i think uh audio's fun because if you close your eyes your imagination's got a million dollar budget um and you knew your pal steve dennis for quite a while uh, yeah, me and Steve uh, go way back. We we're, we're, uh, uh, we we grew up in the same small Welsh seaside town in uh, Swansea in Wales. Oh, that's amazing! Um, and uh, yeah, and you know he he uh, doesn't work in the uh, entertainment industry, but he's uh, you know he's a great co-host on the the Hands On podcast, which is the companion podcast. Uh, and then lots of people like Daniel Hawksford, who's an RSC actor. Uh, uh, um, uh, you know, I've known him since he was four and I was five in Wales. Um, you know, John O'Roberts, who played uh, Draco Malfoy recently on the in The Cursed Child on Broadway, the Harry Potter play. He plays Carl, you know, the sort of long haired right hand man to Hans. Um, you know, I've known it him. It all kind of just naturally came together. It's like everyone 2007. Had some <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you know, and it's about. Hopefully, you know, you want to start this thing very early. Like I started recording people way back before the summer so I could put this together because I had this feeling like, what if I if I could release it just around Thanksgiving? I love the way you think. <laughs> and then lead it up to Christmas, you know. Although now, of course, even with planning at the last minute, it's like, oh, I've got to mix this and this this sound effect. Where do I find that? Mm -hmm. This actor, you know, I need to re-record this actor and, and stuff like that. So there's always, as with anything, there's always last minute. Yeah, hour things people when it are comes asking, to when's project. it coming out? I'm like, let's just go with me here, you know? <laughs> yes, no, exactly. I think I'll be able to make the, the deadlines, although, you know, because it's almost zero budget, I'm a, a one-man band with, with editing it and stuff. Um, but I, uh, apart from actors, I've also got a tremendous uh, uh, guy uh, who composes under the name Marin Gas to do me a brilliant score where it's sort of an approximation of the great Michael Kamen score, but it's got its own thing going on. It's a, a lot more electronic. Um, so that's awesome. And, um, and I, he actually composed a score for me for the feature film that I made, Canaries, um, which I made as a writer director. Um, uh, although in the US it was released on DVD and streaming as Alien Party Crashers. 
So <laughs> if you want to, if you want to search for that, I think it's on Tubi and, and Prime Video and, and, and other that stuff like that. Sounds amazing. So, yeah, it's. I mean, that's fun. I'm definitely in the geeky action comedy sci-fi horror sort of realm. You know, it's 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 definitely. Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, I love human drama. I love romantic drama, romantic comedy. But my preference is if there's going to be um, a meet cute or a family uh, debate or something like that, why not throw some aliens or some vampires in there as well? <laughs> right. <laughs> that's that's my mindset what anyway. You it's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, you know what? It's so nice that this couple is is falling in love, strolling through Central Park. What if some aliens popped around that, about now? You know, uh, what if, oh, the, the, this, this family, you know, this Thanksgiving family dinner is looking really tense. A lot of these people around the table don't get on. What if three of them are vampires? You know, that's my, that's my uh, mindset. I'm just picking ideas off the top of my head. I haven't made these stories. Um, but yeah, that's the that's the that's my that's my mo anyway. Uh, yeah, I'm with you because I mean, Die Hard just kind of opens up. Just anytime you have that villain, just you know, stealing the show, you have just uh, just way more just kind of just fun just seeing the movie unleash. Because the last thing you want is is like, okay, the villain's inevitably going to die or get away for a sequel, but I want them to just have a master plan <laughs> well there's a master plan but there's also if you have a, a good actor and you also have good writers who are able to somehow make the villain interesting and different and also genuinely even though you know at the end of it, uh, an action movie the audience is all bought into the idea that okay we know the good guy's gonna win but we're still excited about how he's gonna win so if you have some a hero who's pretty much invincible and a villain who's clearly not as strong or clever or, or all the rest of it, then there's no dramatic tension, even if you know the, the good guy's going to win. Um, so like, and not and to exactly, diss all the other four villains, but you know they try, and then at the same time, it's like just Hans just too clever for his own good. You know? Well, he's really. I mean, he just. He, he 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 has a plan for you everything. Know, he has plans. He has a plan. D you know, Z. When everything, exactly. when he runs out of henchmen, yeah. when he runs out of foot soldiers, when he runs out of detonators, even. Exactly. He has planned this thing. I mean, the one thing that's a little bit unbelievable, I feel like, in the movie is that, um, and I understand why the writers did it, but it seems like Hans hasn't revealed his whole, whole plan to his henchmen. So he's like, relax, everyone. I'm going to, you know, I'll tell you what's going to happen next. I don't think any, you know, any henchman, even if they were stupid, would sign on to something where they knew. They were going to make millions of dollars out of it, but then they were like, we, we don't know how we're going to get there. <laughs> That's the one thing where I'm a bit like, okay, I, 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 I can't believe that someone as clever as Hans wouldn't just share the entire plan with everybody. Um, but you know uh but that's i'll accept that you know that's like dramatic license i mean i can't um, blame them for where they went basically just like the first one was loosely based off a bunch of detective novels you know that they had already adapted oh. prior you know as like part two was basically trying to be like airport and part three was trying to be like speed type thrillers and other abandoned mad bomber movies and part four was based off a mixture of like cyber terrorism uh, you know, articles and uh, Enemy of the State 2 rejected script. So, yeah, and then part five was basically <laughs> just an article on the Ukraine and Russia. <laughs> Absolutely. No, it's 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 interesting over time that it started off with action novels, old thrillers, and then it, it you know, as with many movies, it became like based on an article, you know, based on a based on a tweet, based on a, you know, a sentence. Based on this and that, yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I mean, you know, it's, I'm going to sound like an old fart, but I, I do think with this, these kind of movies, they don't make them how they used to. And I think what's fascinating to me is that Die Hard, perhaps because it, it's in part inspired by the Towering Inferno, you know, in terms of filmmaking. Oh yeah, that's what it, they intended it to be, like an earthquake, Towering Inferno, and people can't get that. I see other people who. It's like some people consider it a disaster movie and other people don't, and other people consider it a heist movie and others don't. I'm like, it's all of the above. It's everything. It's the first part of the movie is very mysterious before we get to all the explosions. It's just well, this is what I was gonna say. This this the 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 structure of it, I feel like, is like a disaster movie because in most action thrillers, you wanna like 
hit the audience hard with something at the beginning. So the action mm-hmm. starts in most action movies very early on. Die Hard doesn't have a single shot fired until I think 18, 20 minutes into the movie. Right. Um, the first half of the movie is a marriage drama. You know, it's a, a, got a bit of comedy and it's got a bit of that, but it's plotted a heck of a lot like a disaster movie. It's like we get to know the characters, so we care who lives or dies, and we you know. Keep who's waiting who. for Shirley Winters and Gene Hagman from uh, 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 Poseidon Adventure to just come out of nowhere. Poseidon, yeah. <laughs> oh, exactly. Yeah, no, no. But um, uh, yeah, and and it also, I think, I don't know what what you think, Cam, but it also has um, some really great geographical setup. There's a lot of film classes, you know, and and screenwriting classes and filmmaking, you know, film schools, who um, show Die Hard in terms of like what a great way to establish a space, like geographically. Mm-hmm. When when Ellis is like stalking Holly and follows her, there's that steady cam shot. You know, it, it, you 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 establish the corridor and this whole sort of upper floor. There's so many things that that are established. So later on, when people are running around in this space with with guns, you have an excellent idea of geography of where you are. Um, and so many films just don't do that. You know, it's like, where, I mean, where the heck am I? What, what's this? Yeah, I mean, turn it. Uh, some of the best suspense guys are kind of all about just show the establishing shot and yeah, and uh, play around with the lighting. I mean, uh, we we could talk all day about. Uh, <laughs> uh coppola is very and uh various lmj pacula's various cinematographers but yeah it is interesting how i i don't i can't even think of the last movie or show other than like a few heist films good or bad or big or kind of sleeper that really make big big use of the establishing shots it seems like people also like to mix in like rotating camera cranes just because they were given studio nodes we need an mtv kind of style you know yeah i mean even though this was kind of in the era of uh um, mtv uh, as mtv i think mtv sort of filmmaking didn't come in until more into the 90s so you had sort of mtv directors graduating to directing films in the early 90s you know david fincher being a, a famous example but but here in you know in 88 when die hard was made mtv was mtv and movies were movies and, um no other you know, way so around you, it. yeah <laughs> exactly so you had kind of an older school vibe you had some great anamorphic lenses you had yander bond you know giving you these these lens lens flares um <laughs> you know it's just it has a sort of a real classic feel to it and um uh, yeah, I mean, I remember as an actor being in a film that a friend made recently, and he told me he was shooting it anamorphic, and I said, "Can you just point point a little torch at the point something at the the screen so I can I can see it on the monitor, see it do a lens flare?" <laughs> I was just, <laughs> I just, you know, as a kid, I, I I always loved that image, but I had no idea how it was achieved, you know. So to get a sense of it now, is, we uh, always is figured brilliant. it was people barking orders, and it's like that's not even near yeah yeah no it's glass quality glass <laughs> that sounds like it was a great time yeah uh, i still remember vastly my various like uh screenwriting uh classes just because it was just neat to just have that insight and it's like why is this working for me why is it not working for me <laughs> yeah Absolutely. I mean, I think the one danger, though, of, of some screenwriting classes and workshops is that they they teach an established formula where it's like that's that's all we want to stick to. And I think sometimes mm-hmm. rules are made to be broken. But, um, you know, it's it's definitely it's it's it, it, it's good to get a sense of, of what works and why it works. And I mean, you know, Die Hard, you could you could. Um, uh go on with that all day about what works and and sometimes it's it's just this crazy bit of chemistry you never quite know what's going to happen because finding out that the script was being written while they were shooting it nine times out of ten on a movie that's a recipe for disaster but it all seemed to come together um and it, it certainly doesn't seem like it was written as they were going along the only thing that i can think of is is you know the um the truck where the ambulance that they came up with the idea of the ambulance later right um and whenever so, i see people try to make an argument that you know there's a better movie than the original i'm just like no that nostalgia aside it 
really is just very well factored. And as much as they try, I can find gaping plot holes and all the others. And while with, you know, the first one, again, the ambulance is just very minuscule is like they knew it wasn't working and they did their best, you know, to omit as much as they could that wasn't working in an edit. <laughs> No, absolutely. It's uh, But, you know, it's kind of, I mean, it's one of those things where you enjoy the film so much that then you even enjoy some tiny mistakes later on. You know, it's like, oh, you guys are awesome. Like, you, I'll give you this mistake. You know, it's like watching, your, watching your, your kid sort of like, you know, flummox and say a word wrong. It's still adorable. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you, you love the movie so much. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, it's a classic. What can I say? And 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 Gruber is a, a classic villain. Um, and I, yeah, I I hope people uh, want to check out the the old habits, the rise of Hans, because uh, we we we've uh, there's the actual mini series episode is out every Monday, and then uh, the sort of companion uh, inside the episode, you know, a little bit like HBO's inside the episode, we have a sort of companion thing called Hans on, which is every nice. Friday. <laughs> um and that's just that's just limited to five so you know there's five episodes there's five companion pieces and and then that's it and well i'll just sort of sit back and see if people enjoy them and then maybe later on I'll, I'll make some more and what i will tease is that there is a way to tell more stories with hans um but mm -hmm. i won't say how that's gonna happen <laughs> i look forward to the surprises <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for anyone who wants to listen, you can listen to it on Amazon's, you know, Audible, Apple Music, or Apple Podcasts. And is there? Um, yeah. But, but altogether, awesome. um, yeah. I mean, what? So, what are your top Hans moments? What are? Because you know, again, like all the other villains got their moments that, but they're mostly all just kind of tributes. Like they're all either eating. It, it kind of almost becomes lethal weapon. I kind of feel with all the rest of them, like uh Stu mm. colonel stewart in part two is basically like all the other is too much like uh carl and then uh you know simon and even the various villains in part five are basically all imitating uli you know the henchmen where they're just all eating carrots and joking around and part four is basically just a very just james bond kind of villain like tomorrow never dies where they're just like or golden eye where there's like i want to destroy all of washington dc <laughs> yeah you know and it's difficult because because hans gruber really sort of reinvented a type of villain. he's a james you know, bond sort of... villain that never was but then he's so much more he's <laughs> yeah and he's an excellent foil for the sort of Amer american everyman and i think that's you know sort of what they were counting on was what is the american everyman fear he fears <laughs> you know sort of the the sleek european guy who's going to maybe come along and steal his women you know um or, or or whatever you know but that's that's the kind of mindset i think they were going for <laughs> top hans moments i mean we we've we've uh, it's kind of difficult because they're all so good but um uh his entrance you know rickman plays the first sort of minute of his screen time with with no lines but his sense of physicality as, as an actor is, right. is just so so graceful you know there's a shot of him turning and walking down the corridor with with Theo, you know, to Michael Kamen's score, which is just brilliant. Um, you know, so the way he he has presence on camera, and then you know everybody loves his voice. So you know, it's sort of, uh, um, and you know, and I I play Hans in the podcast, by the way. You know, so it's so, you know you <laughs> sort of get a sense of that, and and um, everyone uh, would if you're making this. I mean, want to play. yeah, but you know, you've got to make sure you can do the voice because. Uh, and I'm just lucky in the sense that I'm a fairly good mimic. So, you know, like I'd say his speech is sort of, uh, you, you know, you go a bit deeper and then obviously Alan Rickman is, you know, but but then occasionally with Hans, he, he gives him a little touch of German. So he says computer instead of computer um, and things like that. But obviously his speech, you know, where he says, uh, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, now due to the... <laughs> Nakatomi Corporation's legacy of greed around the globe, they're about to be taught a lesson in the real use of power. You will be witnesses. So, you know, and then sort of closes his file of facts. With it. So I just love that. And I also love um, uh, and, uh, the, you know, sort of uh, uh, 
when Alexander wept, uh, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, Good enough. And when Good and when and that was it. And when Alexander saw the breadth of his domain, he wept, for there were no more worlds to conquer. Benefits of a classical education, um, it, you know. And 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 he, there, there's a wonderful shot where he's looking at the model of the building that he's just captured, that he's just sort of conquered. Um, and so he's very satisfied with himself. But but what's incredible to me is that. I first saw Die Hard on TV, you know, with a pan and scan thing, and he's there just sort of looking at nothing. And it wasn't until the widescreen letterbox version was released that you saw that he's looking at the model of the building. Um, so it was just a lesson in, oh, wow, that this is what it's supposed to look like, and this is how the shots were, were conceived and framed and, and composed. Um, so, so it was great. So I sort of discovered and loved Die Hard, and then I discovered and loved it all over again with this, you know, sort of seeing all this this extra the the extra sides of the screen um anyway sorry that's off topic for hans moments but um uh yeah you know so so in terms of hans after a while speaking like him just sort of becomes second nature uh, just because he's always thinking aloud but he's organized aloud as opposed to frantic oh, oh. <laughs> Well, yes, but it's also just, you know, if, if you enjoy playing him that much, you enjoy the character, then eventually, you know, you sort of start to think, uh, w what else would you like Hans to say? Would you like him to talk about uh, you know, Thanksgiving dinner? You can read dinner. the phone book aloud, yeah. <laughs> Heinrich has burnt the Brussels sprouts again. You know, you could, you could just, and that's what's right for comedy. If you've seen him be that serious and terrorists be that serious in the film. It's it's great fun, you know. Within the podcast, there are moments where they are arguing about flavors of ice cream and stuff like that, and that's what I wanted to uh, to to sort of bring out. Um, you know, is, is you get these these moments of uh, of comedy and also reference, like I said, to uh, to other Rickman films. So, uh, you know, in episode one, you know, he's talking to the leader of the Volksfrei movement, and he says, "Oh, what you want to uh, what, what do you want to do? You want to steal all this money from the rich and 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 then distribute it." Uh, who do you think you are, Robin Hood? So you know, you just sort of get, <laughs> which obviously is a, a a nod to him playing the sheriff of Nottingham. So uh, you know, I mean, it it's it's fan service, but hopefully it's not. You know, it, it's it's not fan service just for the sake of it. It's all organic in the sense that Hans possibly would say something like that. So it, you're not just hopefully sliding in something that's non that isn't organic. Um, but yeah, I mean. You know, come on, we're a bunch of geeks. We've got to have some fun with these characters. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, I think did did you get enough? Uh, we got a bunch of sound bites in there. I think <laughs> <laughs> we, we did. Uh, I mean, uh, all together. I mean, I, I hope more people check this out because I, I think a lot of people are just missing uh, audio made dramas. There, it's kind of the way to go if you don't want to make a fan film or a parody of a movie or a show. You know. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would love people to check it out. I mean, I think, I think you know, I grew up, I'm lucky, you know, I grew up sort of listening to, to some great radio plays on the BBC. The first time I sort of discovered Lord of the Rings was because BBC made a 13-hour radio adaptation of it, um, where Ian Holm, who plays Bilbo in the Peter Jackson films, was playing uh, uh, Frodo in this BBC radio series. And so that was my introduction into oh, wow, you know, I can imagine all these things happening and I'm just hearing the sound effects. And of course, it's, it's um, you know, it's great because the, you can, the imagination, like I said, has a million dollar budget, but also it's cheap to produce. <laughs> um, uh, so, so, yeah, I hope, I hope people check it out. I, I look forward to it. I will be sure to link it. We'll return after these messages. Hello and welcome to Culture Shocked, the pop culture podcast brought to you by four aging millennials and our outdated opinions. Join us every Tuesday as we discuss movies, TV, games, and even music, new and old. Dude, what do you think you're doing? Are you seriously trying to record a promo without us right now? Well, uh, yeah. Dude, you can't just do the promo by yourself. Who's going to listen to that? Yeah, and you probably haven't even told them that we're a pop culture podcast where we always agree on everything. Uh, for instance, the Sam Raimi trilogy, easily being the best of the Spider-Man movies. J no, no. 
But I think we can all agree that Jaws is a classical masterpiece. Mm, nope, don't like that. But we do all agree that the sequel trilogy of Star Wars is the best in the Skywalker saga. Right, guys? That comment is so ridiculous. I don't even know where to Anyways, be- uh, that'll do it from all of us here at Culture Shock. Thanks for listening. Hey, it's Brent Pope, the host of Breakfast with Brent Pope. You've seen me on some of your favorite TV shows saying things like, give it up, Jimmy. You got to sink this putt to win. On Breakfast with Brent Pope, I sit down with guests from the entertainment world and we do it all over breakfast. Or should I say breakfast? Every week on Breakfast, you get inside Hollywood info and tips, great breakfast wrecks and booty debates. Most of all, you get the most delightful 30 minutes of your week. So dig in. It's Breakfast time. Listen at breakfast.com, Apple Podcasts, or wherever fine podcasts are found. Do you ever find yourself thinking about who would win in a fight between Goku and Superman? Hi, I'm James Gavsey, and on the Who Would Win show, me and my co-host Ray ignore anything important happening in the outside world and debate fictional battles between characters from comics, movies, and video games. We got a new show every week, and almost always am I the winner. (laughs) Yeah, not true, Ray. In the past, we've discussed such matches as Captain America vs. Darth Vader, Solid Snake vs. the Iron Giant, classic matchups like RoboCop vs. Terminator, and even the Muppets vs. Sesame Street. That one was crazy. So if you're a fan of geek culture and love a spirited debate, check out the Who Would Win Show wherever you get your podcasts, or check us out at whowouldwinshow.com. We let things pile up in the DVR. We add them to our queues. We wait for the DVDs and Blu-rays. We time shift. The Time Shifters podcast. Sci-fi, horror, fantasy, superheroes, comedy, action, film, television, maybe some not-so-current events. Find us on iTunes or at timeshifterspodcast.com. Cool thing about Blind Knowledge is we are in multiple countries. We are worldwide all across the globe. We are in the U.S. We are in the U.K. We are in Canada, Germany, India, Japan. We're in Australia, y'all. Blindknowledge.com. Now back to the feature presentation. Follow us on the web on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The podcast is available on Podbean, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Anchor, Apple, and anywhere else podcasts are available. Feel free to review our show and leave comments on any of those sites. Thanks a million for listening. It's